Okay, good morning. This is uh, Thursday, September 23rd, class session, Math 261 at Delta College. So I try today to make sure my recording is in order. So any number of technical things can happen. And last time I was out without the computer, I thought I was recording. I apologize, I was recording audio, but the video was a blank whiteboard. So there are two things you can do in that situation. Even if you're in the meeting, you can't tell me that I'm not recording the right thing. But in this case, the audio recording was good. And I was following mostly this handout. Well, it's a series of pages that's posted on my website as the Frenet frame derived. So these are all the calculations that I used in the presentation last time written out nicely. You also have the written notes from that session. So I know that it's inconvenient to try to sync the notes and the audio. You could listen to the audio and read the notes. You could listen to the audio and go through that handout that I showed you right there. But we try to have as small of failures as possible. That was just a medium failure. Okay, now on to the news of the course. You observe that you have exam one coming up. And the way that's going to work, let's talk about Tuesdays and Thursdays. Let's talk about today, which is the 23rd. And then that would make that the 21st, which would make that the 28th, which would make this, I have three spaces. So you add two days, which is September 30, that's not too complicated. Then you add seven days, September 37 would be October 7, and seven days, September 35 would be October 5. That's actually fun to count with dates. So that makes this, Saturday, add two days. September 2 is October 2, because 30 days has September. And then backwards, Sunday would be 3, and this would be 26. So on my website, I have this posted as exam due on the 2nd. I don't think we're going to do that. My goal when I give you some problems that you're gonna hand in after today, you're gonna hand in some homework on 28th by 11.59 PM. So I think what's gonna happen is I'm gonna shift that. So you hand in the homework on Tuesday at 11.59 and then I'll give you the exam. And you'll have, I want you to have seven full days to work on the exam. And you hand in the exam on Tuesday, October 5 at 11.59. So after we make our presentations today, you've got a couple homework problems you work on. And then in these two sessions, the 28th and 30th, we'll just review, do problems you want to do. And if you have problems that you want to do, I want you to bring them. So that's September 28 and September 30. And then the exam one is released September 28 by 11.59. And exam one is due October 5 by 11.59. So that way I give you seven days to work on the exam. Uh, I think that's the format I want to use for these first two exams. The last exam, which occurs in the last week, I had to hand in grades at a certain time. So we might have to shift that a few days forward, but we'll make this arrangement 
that while you're working on the exam, I will not have you working on homework problems. The exam will be your homework problems for that period of time, but we'll always have this two sessions of review while you're working on your exam. On October 5, Tuesday, October 5, we'll begin with the next material. So this will be the schedule that I'll revise on my website. I'll just change that day, but this looks like the presentation that we're going to use. Uh, people want to ask a question about what is the content of the exam? Now, on Tuesday, I could be more specific about the content of the exam, but what I feel, what I've been using during this pandemic time is exams that were on the order of five to six questions that may have a little extra work, maybe slightly different than the homework problems, but almost like a set of homework problems over a week, except your average right now is three to four homework problems in a week. I'm going to have five to six problems on that exam. I haven't completely decided what number. It won't be less than five. It shouldn't be 10. And on Tuesday, I can give you more specific, specific information if you like it. It's going to involve chapters two and three, which we're finishing chapter three today. It's gonna involve graphing things in mathematics also, which you're slowly getting more and more used to. And you definitely want to get used to working in Mathematica. So I would say exam one content, chapters two and three, and uh, number of problems. is unknown, but it could be in the range of five to six, roughly. Now the exam is a take-home exam and there'll be a list of instructions that you have to follow for the take-home exam, uh, ordinary and natural instructions, which I can explain more about on Tuesday, but they will involve you preparing your own work so far in the homework problems, I don't mind if you guys are checking each other and helping each other reach the correct solution, but the home, but the exam problems will be, you know, completely your own work. And I'll bring you those list of rules again on Tuesday, the 28th. Okay. That's not a full description of the exam. I understand, but it's, it's good. It's as much as I can bring you right now. If you have a question like that, did I not say something about the exam? Do you want to know more about the exam? Throw it in the chat and I can answer it or you can unmike. but that's roughly how we're gonna run the exam. The other question, which was really interesting, you were working on a very interesting problem, 27413, describing a solid that was the intersection of two, two uh, surfaces that contained inside the intersection of two surfaces. And he came up with some interesting answers here and there to that problem. <coughs> and there would be more than one way to describe the answer. So I had some questions like, well, could I describe it this way? Was my description also correct? And I really liked uh, when a couple of people did that, that they said, okay, here's the Mathematica notebook that shows how my description works. But two things if you want to do that. So if you think your description is correct and you can show it to me, then uh, certainly I have to revise the points if I deducted something. But I like the fact that you went to Mathematica and I think that should be the rule. If you think your solution is correct, you do have to show it to me. You do have to convince me. Like I said, I saw more than one correct solution. I saw 
a solution that I thought was better than the one I gave. And the one I gave is posted. So if you believe that your description was also correct and I didn't understand it completely or didn't uh, read it appropriately, then demonstrate to me how your answer works in Mathematica. And then again, send me the Mathematica notebook. So a couple situations that go on when you ask me questions about Mathematica. First, if you send me an email that your Mathematica notebook is not working, I cannot help you at all because I don't know why it's not working. If you send me a printout or a screenshot of your Mathematica notebook is not working, I can do a little bit better because I can see what you typed possibly. But again, I cannot see how Mathematica executed what you typed. So this is the standard in our class. If your Mathematica notebook is not working and you have a question or you think something's wrong, you need to save your Mathematica notebook and send me the Mathematica notebook. This is not a simple thing that you can just read through the code and decide always what's right and what's wrong. I have to execute it. You have to execute it before you know whether it's working. So absolutely, Mathematica is an excellent way to check your work, but if you have a question about how it's working, you should send me the notebook. Okay, now we're gonna go on. So as I said earlier, some people checked in since we began, we are working on this handout right here. It's called Frenet Frame Derived. And that can help you recover from my awful recording last time because I was basically following this presentation. So we are at the place where we're going to now finish deriving our practical formulas for kappa, B, and tau curvature, unit binormal, the direction of uprightness, and torsion. And maybe we can give an example here. And with that will come an excellent description of acceleration. So what is the nature of acceleration for a curve in space? So let's recap just a little bit. I'm gonna draw a generic curve on a piece of paper. got my x, y, and z axes. Let me prepare to move my paper up when necessary. And then we're going to take a curve that just flies through space here. Let's not make it too complicated so we can draw on it. Just a plane doing a little loop-de-loop -loop in space. We'll call this curve C. We'll describe it with our parameterization. And that parameterization will describe the X, Y, and Z position of the curve at any time. And it will have a beginning and it will have an ending. And the beginning and the ending give the curve an orientation. I'm going from here to there. One more thing about this curve, an assumption during these calculations, is that as I fly or drive or walk on this path, I am assuming that my speed is never zero, which is equivalent to saying the velocity vector is never zero. And this condition is called smooth. This means I can't double back and screw up my length calculation. It means you and I will have the same odometer reading at the end of the path the same length reading. And in particular, the true nature of smoothness 
is that it allows me to characterize the path by time or by distance. Now, I would use to characterize the path by time if I was concentrating on the object that was flying or pursuing the path, right? Because you and I are driving on a path from here to Chicago, we might arrive at different times. At different times, we will be at different places on that path. But we will pass every one of the same mile markers. And if we do not stop on that path, then we will record the same distance on our odometer. So the idea of smooth allows us to parameterize C by arc length, or in plain English, parameterize the curve by length. Distance covered instead of time elapsed. And this allows us to negate the effects of the different ways people drive along the path in smooth fashion. It also has the advantage of allowing us to examine the path itself instead of examining the multitude of ways that satellite could trace that path. Okay, now let's move on. I'm trying to look at what kind of visual aids I have here because I'm looking for chords and things like that. Yes, I think I might bring in some visual aids in a second. So once we did that, we constructed at every point in space, the frame of reference, the unit tangent vector T that told us which way we were going. This drawing might get a little bit crowded. The unit normal vector told us which way we were turning and was in fact perpendicular to the unit tangent vector. I'll draw my little perpendicular indicator in a second. And then crossing those two and notice by crossing those two and, and you cannot read orientation easily when I'm drawing a three dimensional object on a two dimensional piece of paper. But I would say possibly I could cross this by putting the fingers in my right hand. It's my right hand. Fingers in right hand direction of T curl towards N. My thumb, which is down here, is pointing in the direction of B, the unit binormal, which in this case feels like it's going into the paper. But it's awkward to draw anything three dimensional on paper because these just look like three random arrows, right? I can put my little right angle indicators in here. And in the copying of this later, these indicators might be a little more useful and easy to read. Like I'm making a little box down there under the camera. I understand that they're not excellent. So I will reproduce this at larger scale right here. Let's say that's my unit tangent vector. That's my unit normal vector. And that is the right angle between them. And then unit binormal, I'll make here in green. And that's kind of going into the paper. There's the right angle with the unit normal vector. And there's the right angle with the unit tangent vector. Even there at a larger scale, this is not easy to represent two dimensional, three dimensional objects on two dimensional forms. 
Okay, so we have the representation of these. We have the theoretical representation, and then we have the practical representation. I want to do some other example today where I also want to describe the three planes that go alongside with this. Let's think about a plane created by T and N. And in a sense, uh, it goes on forever, but I'm going to draw it just the one unit square field right here. This is the plane in which turning occurs. This is the plane of T and N. It's the plane that you're turning in. It's called the osculating plane. The plane of T and B. Remember, B is a direction of uprightness. So the plane that contains T and B, this looks a little bit messy in this drawing. This is the plane of uprightness because B is telling me what's upright with respect to the path. This is called the rectifying plane. When you rectify something in plain English, you make it right. Now, making it right and making it at right angles are two different things, but you, you make it corrected. So here you're correcting your uprightness in a, in a sense. It's called the rectifying plane. And the third plane right here, which is gonna cut into my previous description, is the plane that contains the two normal vectors B and N. So I think what I'm gonna do is touch that, touch that plane, touch that plane. Even at large scale, you see how messy things become. This is the plane of B and N, it's the plane that contains the two normal vectors. So it's got a very boring name, it's called the normal plane. You wanna be able to construct these planes, right? So understand that if a plane is containing T and B, then it is perpendicular to what? N, and you create equations of planes by using the perpendicular vector to the plane. If the plane contains B and N, then it is what? Perpendicular to T. So the normal plane is perpendicular to T. And then the osculating plane containing T and N, well, that then has to be naturally perpendicular to B. So we'll create examples of these planes now in an example later. But if someone asks you for one of these planes, it's not a big deal because you have T, N, and B. Okay. I'm gonna move this picture up a little bit. I don't need to refer to these yet. So next thing, and again, I am reading this essentially often from the handout here, page two. I emphasized last time that you had a theoretical description of these objects, you have a practical description. And the theoretical description of the unit tangent vector is the rate of change of position with respect to distance. The practical description is the velocity vector divided by the magnitude of the velocity vector. And the journey along the way, you can see where I construct this practical description. If you think of the magnitude of velocity and velocity, velocity is rate of change of position with respect to time. And you divide by the magnitude of velocity, which is the rate of change of distance with respect to time. You execute the chain rule. 
And dr dt divided by dt ds dt in a sense becomes dr ds, the rate of change of position with respect to distance. So this calculation is a description of what t is, but it's not the way you want to calculate t. This is how you calculate t. And then likewise, the unit normal has a description. and a practical description as well. It's the rate of change of my direction divided by the magnitude of the rate of change of my direction. Because remember, if my direction is changing, the only thing that can change about my direction is the angle. I can't ask, how is the length of T changing? T is one unit long. The only thing that can change about T is its direction. And that is the direction that I'm turning. If I'm simply traveling in a straight line, then T is not changing. The length of T could be changing, but the direction of T is not changing. Sorry, the length of T prime is not relevant. But this would be a total bear to calculate right here, because I'd have to take T, dr ds, take the derivative of that again, so I'd have like, like d squared r ds squared, or d squared r dt squared, and then check the length of that. That's very, very awkward. So we offered you a practical substitute, which is cross v and a, and then divide by the magnitude of v cross a to normalize. This actually points in the direction of turning, and it is one unit long. So this is the unit normal vector. Now, the problem is I've told you that, but I haven't proved that it's true yet. Oops, excuse me. Cross that out. That one belongs here. And that is what I've told you, but not proven yet. So practically, that's why I have the larger drawing above, what you do is calculate B, V cross A over mag V cross A. And then having calculated B and T, you can say B cross T points in the direction of N. B cross T points in the direction of N. That's what I want to place here, excuse me. Whereas ordinarily we would have said B was T cross N after I calculated N. So do not calculate in this order because this is not always a simple calculation. You calculate in this order. You do T and then B, and then you do B cross T to get N. This is really important and common mistake that people make. So always calculate in this order. Okay. Sometimes if you're using a machine to help you calculate, it doesn't make a difference because the machine's gonna do the heavy lifting right here. But if you want to check your work or do anything practically by yourself, this order is simpler. Okay, then we introduced curvature and torsion. By saying, if I take the derivative of my direction with respect to distance covered, that has to point in the same direction as M. But this could be greater or lesser. This could be quite large if I'm turning very quickly. It could be quite small if I'm turning very slowly. So this is a vector, but it could have different magnitudes. 
if I want to make these two things equal, what I have to do is take this vector and mod out by its magnitude. And this makes this equal to the vector n. Or if I rewrite this, slide this quantity to the right-hand side, the TDS is equal to N times kappa. Kappa is the magnitude of the rate of change of T with respect to S. So we said this last time, and kappa is positive number or zero possibly. If it's zero though, we're not turning. And so N is not present. But this is not a practical way to compute kappa. So later we'll show you practical computation of kappa and show you the value of it. Excuse me, and I'm referring back to my handouts. Mag V cross A over mag V cubed. And you start to see a pattern here is that in the description of Tn and B, I just need V, A, V, V cross A, magnitudes, I can calculate all those things. And now here in this description of curvature, I just need mag V cross A, mag V, and then cubed. So V and A so far are telling me everything I want to know. That's almost going to be sufficient to tell me everything I want to know. We looked at dBDS. How is the unit binormal changing as distance changes? And we showed that dBDS was perpendicular to B by dot product and then derivative trick. And then we showed that it was perpendicular also to T by looking at the derivative of a cross product. And that implies that dBDS lies along N. But we don't know necessarily lies along parallel to N. It could be pointing in the same direction of N. It could be pointing in the opposite direction of N. This could be very large. The B could be changing quickly, and that would be a very sharp roll, or the B could be changing gradually or not at all. So the magnitude of dBDS can be changing, and it could be pointing in the same direction or the opposite direction of N. So what we did was defined a multiplier that shaved down dBDS or pumped up dBDS so that it wasn't any more just parallel to N, excuse me, paper. it wasn't just parallel to N, it was also length one. dBDS divided by magnitude of dBDS has to be length one. Now this is almost equal to N, but B can change towards N or away from N. So I have to say that this is a plus or minus right here, right? So how do I rectify that? How do I remove that uncertainty? Well, I define the quantity tau called torsion I define tau to be the number whose absolute value 
is the magnitude of dBDS. Remember, dBDS magnitude is a number. It could be plus or minus in that sense. Well, dBDS magnitude has to be positive, but I could be rolling towards n or away from n. So I have to say that the tau torsion could be plus or minus. But I will require the absolute value of it, which is positive, to match dBDS. So now I can write dBDS is tau times n. But I want to account for the direction of the rolling. So the convention that people use is minus tau times n because they want tau negative to be a counterclockwise roll. So they want tau positive to be a clockwise roll. And I'll describe roll with my pen caps here, which is not entirely beautiful, but there's the direction T I'm going. There's the direction N I'm turning in blue. And here's the direction of uprightness, green. As I bank, am I rolling into the turn? That's when B is turning towards N. Like when I bank an airplane in flight. Or am I rolling out of the turn? I'm turning, but at the same time rolling out of the turn, I'm losing control. It's a measure of losing control. Like when you drive too fast on a freeway on-ramp or off-ramp. Usually you drive too fast on the off-ramp and you drive not fast enough on the on-ramp. So when T is negative, the way I've written this, when tau, excuse me, tau is negative, then the opposite of tau is positive. That says dBDS points towards N. So counterclockwise means dBDS points towards N. And clockwise, this is positive tau, means dBDS is opposite of N. Now, if I want to do this by vector convention, vector drawing convention. Remember, vectors can go in directions, right? So when you write a vector that goes in the direction into the paper, and you're looking at the tail of the arrow, people do that with a little cross. This is a vector into the paper. And when you're looking at a vector that's coming out of the paper, people denote that with a circle with a dot in it. Like you're looking at the arrowhead. The arrowhead is coming at you. This is a vector out of the paper. So the situation right here is that we are looking at the vector going into the paper and the direction of uprightness is green. This is the unit tangent vector going into the paper and the direction of turning is here. So B cross T is M. If you roll, this is the roll, if you roll towards N, this is counter clockwise, and this is a negative tau. If you roll away from n, this is clockwise, this is a positive tau. I would be allowed to describe things any way I want, but by convention, this is the convention that people use, clockwise positive tau, 
counterclockwise, negative tau. Towards n, negative tau. Away from n, positive tau. This demonstrates how you're rolling. You roll away from n, it's positive tau. You roll towards n, it's a negative tau. You roll towards n, it's counterclockwise from the position of you facing forward. Remember the part that's missing right here in this demonstration is you. You are the red X. You are facing forward. I'm looking at the back of your head right now as you fly this path. So with respect to your perspective, you are traveling counterclockwise when you have a negative tau and clockwise when you have a positive tau. Counterclockwise turning towards n, clockwise turning away from n, rolling away from n, excuse me. Okay, so now look at the beauty of this. If we add one more formula, dtds is described as kappa times n dtds, excuse me, dbds is described as minus tau times n. Well, what's missing? T, n, v. What's missing is a description of how n changes with respect to position. So how do I fill in this line? Well, let's go underneath and number paper and tear off sheet so I can move it up properly. Let's actually calculate the NDS. The NDS, now remember N is B cross T, is the rate of change with respect to position of B cross T. And remember the cross product obeys the product rule of differentiation. So this is dBDS cross T, derivative of the first times the second plus the first B cross dTDS. Now I'm particular with my order and directions here because I have to maintain the same order, B and T order, because cross product in opposite order creates opposite vector, right? So notice how I keep B and T cleanly in the same order. Dot product order doesn't matter. But if I continue with this, I can replace dBDS with minus tau n cross t. And I can replace dTDS with kappa n. So now this is B cross kappa m. Now there's a little space twister we're going to do right here, but minus tau t cross n or n cross t right here. Remember t cross n is b, so n cross t is the opposite of b. I'm dragging this out a little too much so that you can see how the minus signs disappear. n cross t is the opposite of b and the opposite of tau times the opposite of b will produce tau times b. Over here, the kappa here is just a scalar function, constant function, not a vector. I can factor out the scalar function. I have b cross n. Let's go back to our image though. A giant image of b cross n. What is b cross n? If I put my fingers in the direction of b and I curl them towards n, I actually go down in the paper. b cross n would be down this direction, opposite of the direction t. So b cross n is minus t.
And then if I think about that minus sign coming out, I'll say minus kappa times T. Now, in the interest of symmetry, I'll write one more line and say minus kappa T plus tau B. That's DNDS that completes the symmetry. Look at this. This is a great victory. These are called the frenet serret equations in honor of the two French mathematicians. And if you want to study more mathematics, you would study these in greater detail in a course uh, about differential geometry, seeing how things move in space with respect to geometries. But there's a beautiful symmetry involved here, like the kappa minus kappa, tau minus tau. And if you think about these in vectors, what you're really saying is that tau prime, n prime, b prime as a vector is equal to this matrix, zero, kappa, zero, minus kappa, zero, tau, zero, minus tau, zero. There's a special symmetry to this matrix. So this says that the TNB frame is a fully contained, fully self-contained frame of reference. Because not only can I describe TN and B, but I can describe how TN and B change with respect to TN and B. So it's a self-contained frame of reference. Remember, TN and B are unit length and mutually perpendicular. They're like the I, J, and K of the X, Y axis, X, Y, Z axis. In the context of differential equations, what I've created here is a first order system of differential equations that describes the rate of change of Tn and B strictly in terms of Tn and B. We're not doing differential equations in this class, but later you might be interested in how to solve such a system of differential equations. Let's save that for another time. This is called a first order system of differential equations. So the great victory that we can describe a path in terms of the path itself. We don't need an exterior frame of reference. Okay, we are getting close to a break, but let me outline what we're gonna do to finish this project. So I did, repeat and review a little bit here because I wanted to present the whole calculation as one unit. But what I haven't done is told you why I could make this claim about B. And I haven't told you where I got this convenient form for the equation of kappa. I'm trying to track my practical and theoretical descriptions of kappa. So kappa and tau. Kappa is the magnitude excuse me I'll write this carefully, the magnitude of DTDS and tau is plus or minus 
the magnitude of dBds. But these are theoretical descriptions, physical descriptions. I want a practical way to calculate these. And I wrote earlier that the practical calculation of kappa is mag V cross A. over mag V cubed. There's also a practical cal calculation of tau that would surprise you. Now, so far up to this point, I've done everything with only V and A. So we got R, R prime, R double prime, position, velocity, acceleration. I could take the rate of change of acceleration with respect to time. This is V, this is A. The rate of change of acceleration with respect to time, which I'm not gonna provide a letter for, this is called jerk. How does acceleration change with respect to time? So far, we've done all of our calculations with RV and A. But if I want a practical formula for tau, I'm gonna reach one more derivative here and say tau, B cross A dotted with A prime divided by the magnitude of V cross A squared. What is this in the numerator? The box product of V, A, and A prime. The box product of velocity, acceleration, and jerk is the numerator of the practical formula for tau. Now I've created practical formulas for everything, just using these three derivatives of position. But remember what the box product is. The box product is a volume of a parallel pipette, plus or minus, depending on the orientation of the A prime. So flying along with us in space, is a little parallel pipette indicator that measures how our path is twisting. This is a hard thing to make real to someone. That's why I'm taking my time right here. When you have a cord, you actually have a natural twisting of the cord, independent of the way you fly that path, a natural twisting of the path. And I'll try to give a physical demonstration of this when we come back from our break, but I might actually have to go in front of the camera to do that because I don't have a lot of space right here. Okay, so what we've left to do is show you why I can use these practical formulas for kappa tau and B. And so you've been patient while we've been preparing this. And now we're ready to do this, but it maybe this is a natural and good time for a break. And let's come back at, we're gonna say 9.01 here, a little bit earlier break than usual. And then I'll show you where I get these formulas. I'm gonna mute my microphone, stretch my legs, you are welcome to do the same.
Okay, what I want to do for you right now is make sure that you have a firm physical grip on torsion. So torsion is not necessarily the airplane doing a barrel roll. Torsion is a reference to the curve itself. And you can observe it in the curve itself. And you probably have had occasion to do that in an electrical cord or any type of cord that you learn to coil up. So this is going to be a little bit different. You could even say it's going to be a little bit dangerous, but we live for danger. So we're going to go to the whiteboard so I can actually show you something in person. Notice I got my beautiful Fresnes array equations on the whiteboard. So if I think about, and I'll try, and the problem is if I stand here and do the demonstration with you, then I got to look at the demonstration on my computer to make sure I'm showing you what I want to show you. This is a cord right here. This is just a length of uh, climbing rope, poly polypropylene rope, and it's just a couple feet long. And you can consider this to be the path that we're flying through. So a little twist here, a little twist there. But this is kind of hard to see physically, but look at how I've got my four fingers on the top of this rope. And I gotta make sure it's on camera, my thumbs underneath the rope. So let me do one thing. Let me take my right hand is over here and reverse my forefinger and my thumb. So now my thumb is on top. Now watch what happens as I twist. I'm having trouble looking at the camera and looking at the monitor at the same time. Watch what happens as I twist my thumb back to position and hold the rope pinched. I introduced a twist into this rope. And it'll be more visible if I allow the rope some space. Do you see how I introduced a turning or a twisting into that rope? And if I shift the fingers of my position, fingers of my right hand, shift the position again so the thumb is on top and not lose grip of that rope and do another full twist of my thumb and forefinger, now I've literally contracted a loop in that rope. So there's no plane flying from my right hand to my left hand. What I'm showing you is torsion in the path, torsion in the rope itself. Now you could do this and make more meaningful to you if you had your own rope. But another way to do it is possibly to look at a band like this. So here's a band that's red, white, and blue. And if I twist it once, you see the twist that I've introduced into the band. Now, literally the red is on top on my right-hand side. And if I twist it again, so blue is back to the top. Now check this out. You think, oh, blue is back to the top. The rope is back to normal. No, the rope is not back to normal. The rope has a twist introduced to it. It has a snag introduced to it. And you would see this if you were using a electrical extension cord or some type of cord that has a physical presence to it, you know, a width, a depth, that if you coil that cord carelessly, then over time, you introduce these twists to the cord, which eventually damage and break the cord, right? And if you, it can be quite dramatic if you have a long extension cord and you just carelessly keep looping it to coil it up. So mountaineers, rock and roll band stage managers, they know the proper way to coil up a rope, which I cannot necessarily demonstrate on such a short length here, but you can find many helpful instructions online. Okay. If we were in person, I think I'd be passing around a rope and making you coil it so that you could feel the tension in the line. Just let me make sure I get back to normal on my space and back to my paper, and then we'll go on. Okay, so our goal now is to find these 
practical formulas for kappa, tau, and beta. And the path that we're going to use to find that will be taking a close examination of acceleration. What is the true nature of acceleration? So now we're going to think velocity divided by magnitude velocity. That's ta, that's a unit tangent vector t. So what would happen if I multiplied both sides of this equation by mag velocity? I create a description of velocity, a very natural description. The velocity is its length times its direction. Never, never overlook the value of describing a vector as its length and its direction, the product of its length and its direction. But now, <coughs> excuse me, to examine acceleration, all I have to do is take the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So follow this calculation. That's the derivative of mag v t with respect to time. But these are two functions of time. My speed changes with time and my direction changes with time. So I've got to use a product rule. So I will say the derivative with respect to time of velocity times t, derivative of the first times second, plus the second, plus the first, mag v, times the derivative of t with respect to time, the derivative of direction with respect to time. Now remember, mag v is already ds dt. Mag v is what? Speed is what? The derivative of position, no, the derivative of distance with respect to time. So what I have here is the second derivative of distance with respect to time. And dt dt, remember, can be resolved into ds dt times dt ds, because I can measure my direction with respect to distance, multiply by the rate of change of distance with respect to time, then I have dt dt, but remember ds dt is just mag v. So this is mag v times mag v, or mag v squared, And this is the second derivative of distance with respect to time. Got my t going on right here. But what is dt ds? According to the equations on our board, dt ds is kappa n curvature times n, dt ds points in the direction of n. So now let's gather these together. Shift my paper up appropriately. Acceleration is a multiple of t plus a multiple of n. The multiple of n is kappa mag v squared. And the multiple of t you would call linear acceleration, the second derivative of distance with respect to time. Now, the interesting thing about this, remember, let's say you weren't turning. Let's say you weren't turning at all. Let's just say you were drag racing your car on the salt flats. So what is acceleration then? Acceleration is completely in the direction of the direction you're going. You're accelerating straight forward, right? That's if there's no turning. But if there's turning, that adds a component to the acceleration and the 
magnitude of that component is kappa times mag v squared. That's kind of interesting. We'll say that in a second. But the first thing I say about this thing we just derived is there's no b. So acceleration takes place entirely in the TN plane. The TN plane is the plane of turning. It's the osculating plane. Now I want practical descriptions of acceleration. And unless I know a formula for S, the second derivative of S with respect to time is not practical. And I kind of want to drive a practical description of kappa. Maybe I can use this expression here. But let me take one more physical thing to make you aware of the value of this formula. Let's say you were driving in a circle. So the T was constantly changing. And the acceleration is towards the center of the circle, swinging a rock on the end of a rope. What about the normal component of acceleration? This is called the tangential component of acceleration. This is called the normal component of acceleration. And people are going to be even more specific than that. Linear acceleration times t is called the, is called the tangential component. Just this right here is called the scalar tangential component. I'm writing too small here. And the kappa times mag V is called the scalar normal component. In other words, multiply by T and multiply by N, then you get the component that goes in that direction. But if you want to know the magnitude of it, it's just the multiplier out front. So let me ask you a question. Let's say you were driving on a freeway off ramp. So here's the freeway and here's the off ramp. It lets you off onto a side street. Okay, I have to be careful. Something is not happening the way I want it to happen. For some reason, my phone cut out but I am still recording my phone. Okay, I'm trying to be sensitive to how to record things. This is a freeway. This is the off-ramp. Let's say I offered you a dare. And the dare was, I want you to drive, I want you to drive on that freeway off-ramp at half the radius or I want you to drive on the freeway off ramp at double the speed. I'm going to offer you a dare. And remember, this is just a theoretical dare. Do not perform this experiment with your car. Well, what does half radius mean? Remember the relationship between radius, sorry, radius and curvature? So if I cut the radius in half, I am doubling the curvature. Notice if I double the curvature, I cut the radius in half. So half radius means double curvature. So which is more dangerous as you take a curve? As you, is it more dangerous to double the curvature or double the speed? 
I think my camera came back on and, and you noted that in the chat. So thank you. If the camera is not on, on your side, let me know again. And remember you control what screen you're seeing of me and I have to control the recording, unfortunately. That doesn't give you any clue as to what's going on in the recording. Okay. Are you gonna take the off ramp at double speed? Or double curvature? Which one is more dangerous? You can check in, in the chat if you like, you don't have to vote, but I'll give you a minute to vote if you like. Oh, if I was some kind of Zoom pro, I'd be popping up some silly poll right now. I suppose you guys have had plenty of Zoom meetings and are sick and tired of polls. Does anybody even want to register whether you choose to take the on-ramp or off-ramp at double speed or double curvature? Well, again, let's look at the component. You want to take double curvature. And what I what I should ask you when you do that is you want to take it because it's safer or you want to take it because it's more exciting. <laughs> if you're interested in safety, that's right. You would take doubling the curvature. And when you look at the normal component, you see exactly why. Doubling the curvature will double the normal component of acceleration, but doubling the speed will multiply, multiply the normal component of acceleration by four. Doubling the speed when you square will multiply by four. So doubling the speed is unsafe, but it might be more exciting. Doubling the curvature, you could probably survive that. Safer. Okay, so let's write acceleration is linear acceleration times T plus normal component of acceleration times N. For ease of writing, many times people call this the tangential component of acceleration, no arrow hat because it's a scalar times AT, plus they call this the normal component of acceleration, no arrow hat because it's scalar times N. But this is a theoretical description uh, I guess theoretical in terms of calculating, it's very practical in terms of understanding. Could I find a more practical way to calculate though? And the dot product and the cross product come to our rescue. Let's look at V dot A. Now V dot A, remember, remember V is magnitude of V times T. So when I dot that with A, ATT, was a n n. The dot product, I dot a vector that's perpendicular, t and n, I get nothing. And when I dot t with itself, because t is unit length, I get one. So what I get is v dot a, is the tangential component of acceleration times speed. Or, because this is equal to one. Or more practically, if I divide by mag V, here's a practical formula for the tangential component of acceleration. V dot A over mag V. Everything can be had from V and A well, torsion in a second is going to require a prime. But here's a practical formula for AT in your heads up readout as you're monitoring velocity and acceleration. How about practical formula for AN? Let's do V cross A. And the same speech for V, mag VT cross ATT plus ANN. 
But now remember that the cross product of two vectors that are pointing in the same direction, you create a parallelogram with no area. You create a parallelogram squashed to a straight line. So T cross T is zero and T cross N from our Frenet frame, T cross N is B. So this gives me mag V, T cross A N, N. The mag V and the An are scalars here. I pull them out of the calculation. This is An. I pull them to the front of the calculation. That's a vector. Mag V. T cross N. Is B. I'm squeezing that a little bit tight to the edge of the paper, aren't I? Okay, so now let's read the left side to the right side. It says that V cross A is A N mag V times B. And this tells us two things. Now remember A N is a scalar and mag V is a scalar, right? So V cross A is a scalene of B. If V cross A is a scalene of B and points in the same direction, because AN is curvature times square of velocity magnitude, it's curvature times speed. AN is positive, speed is positive. So V cross A is pointing in the direction of B and it's in the same direction. That means that I can write B by just dividing V cross A by the magnitude of V cross A. And there's that other practical formula that I saw. So now I have this practical description of B. And now for the last, what can I do with AN? Well, remember AN is a positive scalar. V is a positive scalar. So let's say I magged this whole red line right here. Let me rewrite it so you can follow it. Let's say I magged V cross A. And V cross A is A N mag V B. If I mag both sides of this, I'm being you know, kind of shorthand. If I take the magnitude of both sides of this, then I'm saying the magnitude of V cross A is equal to, but these are positive scalars. I can pull them out of the magnitude bar, A N mag V. They're just numbers, positive numbers. And that leaves me with mag B right here. But mag B is equal to one. So now I have a formula for A N, just divide both sides of this equation by mag V. So here's a practical description of a n. V cross a mag divided by V mag. Okay, very good. Now, remember our mission was to find a practical description of B kappa, and tau. So I wrote those in the opposite order that I spoke them. So now I found a practical description of B. And now I'll give you the practical description of kappa and tau. Remember, An is kappa mag V squared. That's the normal, scalar normal component of acceleration. But I just described An right above as mag V cross A divided by mag V. So if I want a practical formula for kappa, I just divide by mag V squared. I 
think of mag v cubed, here's a practical formula for kappa. Kappa, the curvature of your curve at any point, all you need to do to read that is calculate v cross a mag, v mag, cube v mag divide. So you could create a heads up display that always tells you the curvature of your path at any moment. And in fact, when you're watching your little fun, happy space movies, and sometimes real, sometimes not, but I, uh, my two favorites would be The Martian or Apollo 13. Both of those were relatively realistic. And you're in the control room at NASA or wherever, you got all these television screens and all these numbers flashing across the screens. In reality, you're having constant readouts of the Frenet frame, the kappa, and the torsion. Well, that's some of the data that you're reading. Of course, they're reading much, much more data than that. Okay, so we got this one. Check. We got this one. Check. The last one to fall is tau. So now we need a practical formula for tau. And this is going to require a little more work, but I do document it on the handout that I gave you. Let's check this out. We know that V cross A is A N mag V B. And we know that A N, if you take the magnitude of both sides of the equation here, A N, excuse me, I'll write that more clearly. A N is mag V cross A and mag V quotient. So can we use this description of B, mag V cross A, excuse me, V cross A divided by mag V cross A to come up with a computational way of doing tau. Well, I told you I had to look at acceleration. Sorry, I didn't move my paper up. So now I need a practical formula of tau. And I'm gonna remind you that I have these weapons in my hand. So I need to reach to the derivative of acceleration, which is jerk. Kind of fun to describe jerk. You can look up any kind of nice, cute online descriptions. Let's differentiate acceleration. And acceleration, remember, is ATT plus ANN. And then, you know, linearity of derivative right here. I break that up. But first I'll describe ATT is linear acceleration times T and ANN, the AN is kappa mag V, sorry, moving my paper up, mag V squared times N. Let me number, I tear off this sheet, so I'm prepared to move it up. Okay, so now let's go through this calculation right here. This is going to be a function of t and a function of t. So I got to execute a product rule right here. I have to do, and this is going to be very messy, third derivative of position with respect to time cubed. Third derivative of position with respect to time. I shouldn't say cubed there. That's derivative of this and leave this alone. And then differentiate t and leave this alone. Linear acceleration times the derivative of t with respect to t. But I already know you're anticipating we're going to turn that into dt ds in a second. So that's that product rule. Now we got to execute this product rule. But this is three functions of t. So I first got to do d kappa dt and leave these two alone. Then I have to do kappa 
times the derivative with respect to t of mag v squared, which is sense is gonna be another differentiation rule and leave n alone. So I differentiate this, leave these two alone, then I differentiate middle, leave those two alone. This is the product rule in general. And then I have kappa and mag v squared alone, and then dn dt. And you know this drill that dn dt is going to be converted to dn ds, and dt dt is going to be converted to dt ds. How? Well, dt dt is dt ds times ds dt. I'm pronouncing my t's carelessly. This is the magnitude of t, the vector. This is t, the unit of time measurement. So I can replace dt dt with this expression. And remember this is the magnitude of velocity. Likewise, I can replace dn dt with <coughs> excuse me, dn ds times ds dt. Again, ds dt is the magnitude of velocity chain rule says this is dn dt, but now I have one more trick up my sleeve, and that dt ds by the Frenet-Serre equations is kappa n. And dn ds, a little more messy by the Frenet-Serre equations, is minus kappa t plus what? Tau b. Now, this is a horrible mess I'm going to write now. And if you want to follow every piece carefully, you can follow it on the handout I gave you. But let's look at A prime now. Let's look at A prime now. It's got T's in it. It's got N's in it. Through the dn dt, it's even got B's in it. And dt ds introduces another n. So what I want to say is the a prime here is certainly made of multiplications of t and n and b. So this is in the Frenet frame. So let's write down the t pieces, the n pieces, and the b pieces. as carefully as we can. So let's scan. Here's a T piece. I'll put the T out front because it's just a scalar. The third derivative of position with respect to time. You might wonder what we're gonna do with that. Well, don't worry about it. It's gonna disappear in a second. So you might be speculating what the third derivative of position with respect to time is. Is that a linear jerk? Well, I'll let you investigate that on websites. This has no T in it right here, because that's just kappa N right there. Here's just an N piece right here. Here's an N piece right here. But this has a T piece in it. So remember, dN dt, this is a vector here, excuse me, will be velocity times this expression right here. So for this t right here, I'm going to pick up a kappa velocity minus kappa velocity. And I already had a kappa velocity squared attached to that. So you can check this out elsewhere. But what you have, I'm sorry, I already had a kappa velocity attached to that. So what I have here is, oh, I got to be careful how I say that. And I'm even going to be careful. Maybe my written notes, I'm not sure if I've lost a kappa or not, but let's say minus kappa. You can look at the written handout and decide if this is missing or not. So as I trace through this expression, this mess, these are the things that are scaling t. 
Now let's look and see what's scaling n. No n right here. Oh, there's a kappa n right here. So this is linear acceleration times kappa n. And I already had linear acceleration cap n. So I'm going to say, what this is kappa. Remember, I have to introduce a mag v when I do this because it's mag v times n. Mag v and linear acceleration d squared s dt squared. That's one multiplier of n. Then I had another multiplier of n, which is right here, d kappa dt mag v squared. What am I going to do with this horrible mess I'm creating? And then I had another multiplier of n right here, which is kappa times the derivative of v squared. But now I do the v squared derivative by chain rule will be 2 dv dt. 2 times the derivative of speed with respect to time. So I pick up 2 kappas times the second derivative of position with respect to time times speed. Because the derivative of this expression right here is 2 mag v to the first power, but then the derivative of mag v, which is the derivative of ds dt. Those are my n pieces. And now comes the fun part. What are the b pieces? There's, first, there's no b written here at all, right? Certainly no b in there. No b in here, because this eventually only involves n. There's no b in here or here. The b is introduced right here. The n dt is minus kappa t plus tau b, and we've already used the minus kappa mag v right here. And that's why I think that this is a square here, but my notes, I believe I only have a single kappa right there. But the b comes in when I take mag v times tau times b. That's what sits right here. But I've also already got a kappa and a mag v squared. So the b component, if I add it all up, is a kappa, a mag v squared, and then this piece, a tau, and another mag v. And that's the multiplier of b. This is mag v cubed. So let me simplify this for you a little bit. And I'm going to simplify this not by trying to figure out what these components of t and n are, because it's going to turn out these components of t and n will disappear. Let's focus on the components of b. Kappa, tau, mag v, cubed. How can I make these disappear? How can I claim that they're irrelevant? I mean, they're certainly there, and there's certainly components of this, but now let's take V cross A and dot it with A prime. This comes at you, I love you, but where is V cross A? V cross A only has a B component, right? Let's go back up here. V cross A, is pointing in the direction of B. So when I mag out by V cross A mag, I get B. V cross A is A N V magnitude times B. 
So if I write this as a n v magnitude times b, and I dot that with a prime, watch what happens. Well, since this is just a scalar multiplication of b, I'll do b dot each one of these components. But b dot t is zero. So I don't care what's here. b dot n is zero. So I'm not worried about what's there. The only non-zero component I get right here is when this multiplier of b dots this multiplier of b. So when I multiply these, I get a n mag v b dotted with kappa tau mag v cubed times b. Let's see how these work. This is, let's see if we survive this mess. A n kappa tau. It looks like I have four mag v's. That's going to make me a little bit worried. Let's see how we resolve that. But then b dot b, which is naturally what? One. Any vector dot with itself is the magnitude of its vector, and b is magnitude of one. So b dot b is mag b squared, which is one. So now let's set these equal to each other. b cross a dotted with a prime is this vector, this number right here. This is a number on this side. This is a number on this side. This number could be positive or negative, depending on the orientation of a prime. This number could be positive or negative, depending on the orientation of tau. So since these are all numbers on both sides, I could solve this equation for tau. So first of all, I'll insert a n. Remember, we made this view up here. a n is mag v cross a over mag v. A little more mag bar in there. So this is mag v cross a, hang in there. We're about to land this puppy. Right, here's kappa, here's tau, here's mag v to the fourth, and that must equal mag, that must equal v cross a, excuse me, dotted with a prime. Notice I lose one of my mag v's now. And now I'm gonna replace kappa. How do you replace kappa? I have a practical formula for kappa up here. Mag v cross a divided by mag v cubed. Well, that's convenient. Mag v cross a divided by mag v cubed times tau and times this mag v cubed. Now I get to cross out those two. And I get to combine these two. So just to gather this up slowly, b cross a dotted with a prime is mag v cross a squared times tau. So now I have a formula for tau. Cost me some time, but it's a very practical formula for tau. B cross A dotted with A prime, the box product of V, A, and jerk, divided by the area of the parallelogram formed by V and A squared. This is a beautiful practical formula for tau that only depends on v and a, and I have to pull in the jerk, the a prime. Okay, this was a lot for you to swallow. 
in one go. I don't want you to reproduce the calculations that I did here to get down here, but I want you to know this formula. So last thing we'll do here, just let me flash the formula sheet we've gone through. We've gone through formulas for all of the things that we've done in these first two chapters. Let me check this out with you. We got our basic formulas like how to calculate the area between two angles, uh, between two vectors. By the way, this formula sheet is on our website called Formulas One. We have the projection of one vector onto another, very basic things. And then we recognize the area of a parallelogram crossing two vectors and the box product, which we just used to our advantage. The absolute value of the box product is the volume of the parallel pipe in. Without the absolute values, that box product could be positive or negative, and that measures a positive and negative torsion. You can calculate distances from points to lines either by taking a parallelogram divided by its base to give its height, or a parallel pipette volume divided by its base to give its height. So you practice using these formulas. In the book, he gave these formulas in a little more messy version, so make sure you could use it either way but this is a practical way to describe it. And then we jumped into curves in space, position, velocity, acceleration, and one more derivative, derivative of acceleration is jerk. We define the length of the curve in space, and we defined a function called the arc length function, which measures the distance I cover as I travel on the curve. This is my odometer. This is the length of my trip. I can measure the speed by taking the magnitude of velocity. And from those things, speed and acceleration, I can construct the Frenet frame. The unit tangent vector, the direction I'm going, the unit normal vector, theory and practice. And you do it this way practically. And the unit binormal, theory and practice. You calculate this in practice. This gives me a theoretical and a practical description of kappa. And this is a practical description of tau, which we just determined. And then I have tangential and normal components of acceleration, theoretically and practically, theoretically and practically. I could take these one step further and that in the plane, I can talk about projectile motion in this fashion. I can talk about projectile motion literally in space, but there's a difference between projectile motion, you know, throw the golf ball across the room, you got a parabola, and the true motion of the golf ball. When you hit a golf ball, it never travels in a parabola. Unfortunately, my golf balls travel, you know, not even in the same plane. I have a terrible, terrible slice. And I play golf like once a year with my dad or my son. But I have a terrible, terrible slice. I could hit the ball 300 yards, but it only goes 200 yards because of the slice. Maybe I should try, stop trying to hit it so hard. Okay, but you can describe projectile motion in the plane in this fashion. To describe projectile motion in space, you'd have to incorporate acceleration due to rotation that changes the path. And that's not terribly well what I'm interested in right now. So you can try some problem in the book where he describes that. I'm not interested in focusing on that right now. Okay, so now we have finished chapter two, which was to describe space to you and describe how you can measure how you move around space. Chapter three was to introduce actual movement into space along the curve and how you can use your calculus knowledge to totally understand that curve, every single aspect of that curve, the Frenet frame and the frenet Saray equations. Actually, this is quite an accomplishment and you've been very patient. So thank you, whether you're listening to this live or later. So you got some problems you're gonna execute and then we'll move on to 
review and exam one next week. Uh, keep popping around with Mathematica, keep playing with that so you get used to it more and more as we go along. Maybe in our review sessions next week, we'll do a few more Mathematica demonstrations so you feel like you can use that when you need to double check or check things. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the recording. You're welcome to stay and ask a question.